This podcast is sponsored by InstaRead, an app made for people interested in personal development and growth. I'll talk more about their exciting offers for our listeners later on. Hello, and welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast, your weekly dose of inspiration and exploration. Join me, your host, Sam Harris, as I discover how mindset can help you do incredible things through my conversations with the world's most interesting people, from tech billionaires to leading scientists, best-selling authors to notorious hackers. The goal is to increase our collective wisdom and attitudes to make us all happier and healthier, wiser and wealthier. Who doesn't want that? Today I have Matt Brady on the podcast. He was the CMO of Just Eat during their meteoric rise across Europe, from a small takeaway booking startup through to their IPO at almost $2 billion. He led their marketing team, which helped change the brand from having just a dodgy website selling kebabs to becoming the most famous takeaway app in the continent, to the point where instead of saying, let's order a takeaway, you'd instead say, oh, let's use Just Eat tonight, when actually you mean, let's just get any form of takeaway, regardless of the platform. So he explains what they did to create such an iconic brand as well as numerous other business lessons. And as Matt had a very successful exit from the business, we also dive deep into what the hell does a human do with their life when they don't need to work for money, which is just quite fascinating and how to answer existential questions about the meaning of life. So it's a lot of fun and I hope you enjoyed the podcast. On a scale of one to 10, how weird are you? Me? How weird am I? I don't know. You tell me how weird I am. I met you five minutes ago. Are you scared? We're in a room together. Uh, You're locked in. Yeah. I mean, I'd be scared. I'd be more scared. You've been more scared. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's not weird enough then. No. My intention is to be yeah, so weird that you're frightened. Anyway. So what are you not very good at? Oh, God. Where do we start? I guess I'm not great at analysis of questions like that. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, I mean, I've always tried to be as analytical as possible a marketing career but on the other hand I'm not great at it and I'm much more creatively instinctive rather than analytically instinctive so spreadsheets some doing budgets core skills that a CMO of a global company should have just fake them fake them to the catch you okay so do you think you can get by as a CMO without them as long as what you're doing is good yeah you can get away with anything as a CMO. I mean, that's a great topic for this podcast, considering some of the things we did. You can get away with being creative and having a strong voice in the process as long as your product is growing. It's when there's trouble, everyone starts giving you their opinion and starts yeah. trying to control you, tell you what you're doing wrong. But when you're winning, everything's always easy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Because they say that about investors. It doesn't matter who your investor is so much if everything's going well. Yeah. You know, Just Eat's now a big organization and it's on the FTSE. And I was always trying to battle this preconception that, well, once we're on the FTSE, we've got to grow up. Yeah. The FTSE doesn't give a monkeys if you yeah. grow up. The FTSE cares about growth. If you're getting growth by being silly, then be silly. Don't start thinking you're adverts so and we've got to be sensible and straight because the business is now a FTSE 100 company. What gets you to be a FTSE 100 company and stay there is growth. Mm. And you won't get growth by being dull. That's interesting. Did you worry that's something that they're not doing? I don't worry. It's not my problem. I'm off having fun. But um, they're clearly boring. Their adverts are straight adverts for a company that delivers takeaway. I mean, we just commuted across London to get to this room. We probably passed 300 plus adverts. I literally, the only advert I noticed was the Just Eat one. Not because it's good. It was because our CMO of Just Eat. Yeah, it's contextually relevant to me. And I thought, mm, there's a man flying through the sky with a rainbow. I thought, hey, it looks Great. like Skittles. <laughs> but I didn't notice hardly any other adverts. I mean, that's a lie. I noticed, I think, quiz clothes because the model was very pretty. But then that's them using evolution to trick me into looking at pretty mates. But apart from that, I didn't notice a single poster on the way here. And I've travelled all the way from Bishop Stortford. For adverts to be noticed, marketing to be noticed, Safety doesn't work. You've got to have something that people will remark upon and notice. Is it hard, though, when you're a bigger company and things do become a bit more bland because you get too many opinions? It's not hard. It's seen as inevitable, and I would say it shouldn't be inevitable. I think it's where probably the UK 
establishment is behind the curve on supporting growth companies as they become big. And that's why you want to be fiscally responsible. You want to obviously obey the laws of the country. But that's not the same thing as becoming dull and straight down the middle. As a communicator, you talk to a lot of people who are growing startups. And a lot of the conversations you have are about passion, vision, those core values. But they're innate in a startup because you're a family type environment. There's 10 of you, then there's 20 of you, then there's 50 of you. Even at that size, those family values of that group are inherent in the group. They emerge from the group. Obviously, when you get to being 1,500 people, that's a lot harder to get that coherent family feeling that we're all in it together, battling to slay the dragon type feeling. It's become a job for a lot more people. And people that just want a job tend to be more conservative. Whereas people that join startups are attracted to adventure. They're Jedis. No, no, actually, no, Jedis do not seek adventure. Maybe startup people are Sith. When the Jedis turn off, it gets boring. Mm. Sitting around in their robes, meditating. <laughs> like me and Sam Harris. You and the real Sam Harris. Yeah. <laughs> Nightmare. But yeah, so on the subject of just the now as in Deliveroo and Uber Eats have suddenly appeared, do you think the Just Eat model is going to need a massive change then to compete with them? You know, you have to understand the Deliveroo model is massively loss leading. I mean, what Deliveroo have been good at is raising money. What they've not been good at is making money. Just Eat is insanely profitable per order. I mean, Just Eat doesn't deliver the food. It takes an order off a website or an app, pings it via an SMS to the restaurant, who prints it out on a bit of paper, tears it off and delivers it. He delivers it. So all of the contractual issues of employing people is on him. So all Just Eat's doing is sending an SMS from a technical point of view or from a cost point of view. Just the investment goes is in having a robust, technology stack that handles millions of orders a night and builds a brand that attracts millions of orders a night. That's the magic bit that Just Eat does really well. Deliveroo, on the other hand, has to employ these drivers on various interesting contracts. Those drivers are either going to be a cost or they're going to be demotivated that they're not earning money. And it's just massively lost leading. So the restaurants that work with Deliveroo put their prices up and Deliveroo let them do that. Just Eat's never let a restaurant put its prices up. The price you see on Just Eat is the price that you pay if you walked into the restaurant. Okay, so certainly it's like a nightmare business model. As you went into it, I ran a logistics company. Do you not worry that the restaurants have a better proposition working with Deliveroo if they can put their prices up and they don't have to deal with the fat of themselves? There's lots of different types of restaurants to think about. So Just Eat's got 30,000 plus takeaway restaurants that deliver food. Those 30,000 restaurants are all massively profitable for Just Eat, right? So firstly, you've got that cash cow of genuine cash profit. If Just Eat then wants to enter the more expensive to service space of restaurants that don't deliver, Just Eat's got a war chest of these 30,000 profitable restaurants that are making mm. loads of money. I look at it as akin to Google. Google makes loads and loads of money, obviously, from AdWords and pretty makes zilch from Gmail, Google Docs, all these other things that I live by, because it makes enough money from the occasional time I click on an ad, it doesn't need to charge me for any of those extra things. So it can own the market in all these other spaces because it's got a profitable cash cow in the middle. That's the way I would look at it with Just Eat and Deliveroo. Deliveroo does not have that. All of its orders are hard to service. But, you know, it's fairly profitable in any cities around the world. It's a great service as a consumer. I'm just, what's the long-term game there? Their current long-term game to try and make some profit is to start building their own kitchen hubs. But Deliverance was doing that in London 10 years ago. That's not necessarily a mass market scaling profit centre. It'll work maybe in a few postcodes of London. It mm. probably won't work in Colchester, Glasgow, Chelmsford. That's interesting, though, but if you've got the data on what's the most popular things being ordered right now and you can deliver it much faster and make it in less expensive locations... But the appeal of Deliveroo is they've got access to marquee brands to attract traffic to the site, not to come and bought, order food from Deliveroo itself. And that's an ancillary opportunity for Deliveroo to try and make some profitable money. But their core business is this other stuff, which is actually barely break even or loss making. Again, go back to Just Eat. The core of Just Eat is incredibly profitable cash cow. So Just Eat can do what Deliveroo do for a lot longer without raising a penny because it's already floated and it's already massively profitable. 
how long can Deliveroo keep raising money? I'd speculate probably not much longer, but I don't run Deliveroo. Uber Eats is another interesting one. Obviously, they've got their problem with the mayor's office, but beyond that, they've got a much bigger problem, which is they can't recruit enough drivers for their core product. If you talk to people that work for Uber in London, their core challenge isn't growing Uber Eats, it's recruiting people in London. If you try using Uber at 7.30 in the evening in London now, it's pretty much always on search because they just don't have enough drivers. Okay, cool. So maybe let's backtrack a bit into Just Eat. Well, what did you do before Just Eat? Where do you want to start, Sam? It's like a shrinks office. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I, my career started playing a video game called Elite. It's a trading game. You're flying from one solar system to another, selling bits and bobs in one, buying stuff and flying it back to another one, making money to upgrade your spaceship. At least I love that. In a way, that taught me entrepreneurialism. <laughs> and, and I laugh about it, but I do think there's a correlation between people that are good at digital marketing and video games because digital marketing it's a lot about experimenting to get through the objective to see what your high score is going to be like level of a video game mario it might take you 10 attempts to master a level in but you don't feel bad doing it and i think there's a real core skill set of trying and failing and trying again until you succeed so we've gone completely off tangent so what did i do before <laughs> yeah. i play video yeah, games that's quite poignant that's so that made me think about business. I didn't know what kind of business. I really like being creative, but I really can't draw. So what kind of business jobs involve being creative, but don't involve the actual drawing? I ended up doing business courses at college and university. Then luckily, by the time I came out of university, the internet had just got pictures on it. I'm only 44. It makes me sound really old. <laughs> the internet never used to have pictures on it. There was no pictures on the internet, and then there was. Then they started becoming marketing once there's pictures on it and yeah i came out of university with a business degree but taught myself html in the months after the degree just when i was sitting around looking for graduate jobs and lo and behold it was that skill set that actually got me interviews the fact that i taught myself html and had a marketing degree so that was off on an e-commerce online digital marketing career i worked in all sorts of interesting companies i worked for coots bank at one point for six months and I actually quit on the end of my probation. But luckily around that time, again, going back to video games, I was playing an online game called Quake. Have you heard of Quake, Sam? I have heard of Quake. I've okay, Quake. good. We're getting nearer to Sam's age group now. Some of the people I played Quake with have started working for this company called Gameplay.com, which was a spin-out of Dixon's and British Telecom, which was aiming to be the first big online portal, if you like. I think it was a portal back then, like mm-hmm. Yahoo. So I went there and that really kick-started the proper online career, really. Okay. And you were there for quite a long time? That lasted for two or three years. And then it, like a lot of London dot-coms, it got sucked into the black hole of the dot-com bubble bursting. And then my manager bought it for a pound. So I did another year or so working for him. But I was working from my home, which was boring because I was used yeah. to being in London, being sociable. So I made the logical jump from a video games company to the Financial Times. Then I was in charge of digital marketing there. What I really enjoyed about that change was it's using the same skill set for optimizing online channels for selling Lara Croft. It's the same skill set for optimizing selling company data subscriptions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that became my policy for us. Like, great, whenever I change jobs, I'm going to totally change industry, but keep the same mm-hmm. skill set and use it. So then after that, I went into restaurants. I went to work for Top Table. I ended up at Just Eat selling kebabs. I got introduced to Just Eat by Index, who are the mafia of this trade in London, as you know. Yeah. Twice they tried to make me meet Just Eat, and it took them a couple of efforts before I would take the meeting. So, and when I met Just Eat, I just fell in love with the team. They were hilarious because I was quite offish. I was like, yeah. why would I want to come and sell kebabs yeah, yeah. on the internet? And they're like, your website looks terrible by the time. And they were like, we know, that's why we need someone to help us fix it. So what I liked about that opportunity was I could tell from the people I'd be working for and with, creative license to lead and direct mm-hmm. where things would go, which turned out to be true, which was just incredible fun. Yeah, it's really nice when you get a job where you get to do what you're good at and have control to do all that. Did you not have that so much before? Not in the Financial Times, no. Because I was a senior product marketing 
And even the marketing director's got limited power. She works for the person running the paper who's working for Pearson, who's working for the whatever. So it's, it's an establishment company. You know, it's a great company, but it's not the sort of place you're going to be creatively fulfilled necessarily. A lot more fun working for Top Table, which ended up being sold to Open Table. But again, there was working for a founder who had very strong views. And founders with strong views can be problematic if you've also got strong views. So, yeah, getting a gig with um, Just Eat, where they treated me as a co founder, the brand founder, as they like to label me, it was great. It was a real partnership. I never felt like I worked for anybody. And that's the great feeling of why people start their own businesses. So Just Eat was the biggest, well, the most memorable of the food brands back when it was around, I think, compared to Hungry House and things. And yeah. Did you feel responsible for its success? Because have you helped? No. It There's hundreds of people in Just Eat that are responsible for its success. Just Eat has had, I don't know what it's like now, fantastic internal culture. It's half Danish, half British, but it's also very European. When I joined, it was already in six countries, very well led by a guy called Klaus Neingard in, with an international approach. So we took three or four meetings a year where we'd get all of the managers from the businesses around the world, two or three days working on what we were doing. Once a year, at least, we'd get the entire staff from around the world, even if it was a thousand odd people, to fly over for a party. So it really valued that internal culture of trying to maintain that one family feeling. There's no one individual responsible for success. And that goes back even before Klaus to the original founders who did like a party. Yeah. So we maintained some of their culture in terms of the having fun and partying that took off some of the rough edges. So my team, initially we were small. I was worrying about what we were doing. Facebook had only just started letting business have business pages. There was no way to advertise. So we were just ourselves on social media. It was very authentic to what the company was. We weren't pretending to be. There's some hilarious, really bad videos on YouTube of original teams singing the 12 Days of Christmas. Terrible production values. looks awful. But at the time, companies weren't doing mucking around like that. Now everyone has a content strategy and tries to look yeah. authentic. But we just authentically got social media because we were sociable. Very quickly got a million followers on Facebook. I think we were one of the first UK brands to get there because you couldn't spend money at that point. And that really helped fundraising for later rounds as well. Yeah, there's something to be said. When you join a really good team, it makes you do your best work. And on that, do you think that you'd be in a similar place right now if you joined a different company? If I'd gone somewhere else, do you think I would have had the same impact on that company? Possibly eventually. I don't think that's about me, though. I think that's about a jigsaw puzzle piece of 550 pieces, of which I'm one. And there's lots of people that contribute to the success of that business. But I've been there two and a half years and I worked out that nobody had left the business voluntarily. Several hundred people, nobody had quit. I thought, well, that's a really valuable asset from a cultural perspective. And it was hard work. I'm making it sound like a right laugh. We were all working hard. We were just having fun doing it. But again, that goes back to, I think that's culturally then what part of why you become a success. If it doesn't feel like work, people work longer and harder. If your audience is aimed at people that are doing startups, one of the things, you know, I do a lot of mentoring with startups myself. It's like, you know who you are as a culture of the founding 10 people. Don't bring people into that culture that are going to clash with it because bring people in that will enhance it. You are recruiting friends yeah. as much as you are talent. You can get distracted by the quest for talent from because then you can hire really talented people that can be real flies in ointments. What's your biggest tips for how to ask the best questions in an interview? One thing that our CFO used to do was just tell people an anecdote about him cleaning the toilet and just see how they reacted, get a sense of would they want to clean the toilet. He's never going to make them clean the toilet. It's more of a case of are they the sort of people that are going to roll their sleeves up, whatever the task, to get this thing built. I mean, it's tricky, isn't it? From a marketing perspective, I value creative minds probably too much than I should. So I would always set creative for the final selection. I'd always get the last two or three candidates to do a pitch and just see what's coming out of their brains. That was the only way, really, to weed out creative thinkers. Yeah, it's a good one trying to hire the right people. I mean, what I find works with startups quite well is taking on someone for a few months for mm. two or three days a week, and if they're brilliant, then bring them into the business full time. Nice. Okay. 
how did a setback or failure set you up for later success? I hate questions like that. I think I've got a really bad brain at remembering bad things. Yeah. But I learned an awful lot at top table. So there was a myriad of lessons from that three-year period that really set up a lot of this initial success we had with the marketing department at Twisty. For example, the founder of Top Table had a very strong creative vision, which I always respected and thought was great. It wasn't mine, but it was hers. And again, that's something I then took with me into Just Eat. For me, I can't take food seriously. For me, it's a treat. We're not doing what McDonald's does, which is pretend to sell salads. This is not stuff you should eat 10 meals a week. It is an occasional treat. One positive leadership lesson from that founder was actually having a strong point of view on the creativity can really help. And I think that's probably what you see lacking with the current suite of just the adverts. There's guiding creative voice behind them. They're optimised for telling as many people as possible. Yeah, so there's lots of lessons I learned from having a bad job, if that makes sense, which I then took into helping try and make my own department good when I got a chance to build a big department across the world. How did you empower people to be creative and think differently to what you were thinking, maybe? I think it comes naturally to me because I'm very lazy. Yeah. My ideal way of ending a one-to-one meeting with reports was, you're boring me now, please just leave. I mean, I very much subscribe to the David Brent School of Communicating with Staff. I'm still, I mean, I'm seeing two people today that used to work for me. I mean, maybe they're the only two that are still speaking to me. <laughs> so I don't think I insulted too many people too badly. But no, I'm not that disciplined. I'm a fireworky brain. So I need my North Star, which is trying to tell a story about mm. trying to ban cooking or whatever it might be. And that's where I'm good at getting that message out to the team. What I'm not good at is going through their spreadsheets while they're trying to tell me how well they're optimizing PPC. No, big shout out to, let's give a shout out to Erfan, who's still there doing his PPC on spreadsheets. Wow. I still don't care, Erfan. <laughs> and I would be hiring people that are much better disciplined than me. Also, having really good number twos, yeah, having a good set of deputies that are much more disciplined than you are. So, yeah, they were able to take the sparky, fireworky boss leadership vision and be more disciplined about executing it. That's quite interesting because I have been meeting some founders lately that, they're hugely successful, but they seem to be on like a slightly different planet. They definitely couldn't deal with making any of this happen. Somehow managed to get a team behind them that deal with turning weird ideas into actual reality and organizing everything. Now, I'm quite a doer. and I'm quite single-minded about doing the thing I'm, I'm going to do. And if you've got 100 people in the marketing department, it's not going to fly, is it? You can't be interested in 100 different projects. But what you're trying to do is set objectives and goals that everyone understands. The magic of it is having KPIs, and the point of KPIs is the first word, key. There are three KPIs that are going to change this business to success. What are the three? Put them at the top in bold. The rest of them might inform the top three. So for me, when Just Eat got really big quite quick, my KPI became quite clear to me, which was brand. And that was a big road to Damascus change in my brain because I'd been a digital marketing gamer e-commerce was the phrase we used before digital marketing i was an e-commerce specialist rather than a brand specialist what i learned most from just eat was having the more powerful the brand kpis we got every single digital kpi effortlessly improved without too much more effort so my kpi became the brand stupid and that's now been my mentor and investor and all the things i do now how did you measure brand as a KPI exactly? We used YouGov because we had big budgets by end. But earlier on, we used other companies that did a similar thing. So we would basically do a brand awareness survey of name a company which you can order takeaway food from online. I think we cheated because we asked the audience. I think the first question was, would you ever consider ordering takeaway online? The second question would be, name a company. So it was slightly filtering for online aware audience but nevertheless when we first started doing that Domino's was by far the biggest brand in space and we were a distant distant second by the time we finished Don't Cook Just Eat we were ahead of them and they were way back not that people had forgotten Domino's but they were not the first thing coming out of people's mouths anymore how do you think that campaign changed things for those listeners that didn't see it 
We did a marketing campaign once called Don't Cook, Just Eat. And it was really an anti-cooking marketing campaign. How it came about was using the Eat Big Fish kind of process. We worked with those guys. It's a marketing agency, but it's also a book called Eating the Big Fish by Adam Morgan. Highly recommend it. Yeah, yeah, I am on commission sales. I need all those 50 Ps. So Eating the Big Fish. And through that process, we got a really strong sense of personality that we were quite rebellious, basically because we argued an awful lot in their sessions. If you're rebellious, what are you rebelling against? It seemed obvious. If you're selling food that's been cooked, we don't want you to cook. Well, we can't be anti-cooking. It's so in the zeitgeist that everyone should be cooking. You know, this was a time of Jamie Oliver being on the TV all the time, talking about school dinners. Gordon Ramsay was the biggest star on TV. There's loads of people taking pictures of their food on Instagram, foodie culture, food markets, Taste mm. of London, all these kind of foodie. It would be hilarious if we were the one thing in society that was standing up to foodie culture. We can't do it. The fact that we think we can't do it means that we should do it. And we went for it. Yeah, it worked brilliantly. I mean, if you saw those adverts on the underground, you'd think, what is that company doing? It's trying to ban cooking. Oh, I get it. They're a takeaway company. But the fact you had to think for a second about why on earth the company was trying to ban cooking, that made your brain click in a few neurons that all the other 300 adverts you saw in your commute don't do. Honestly, you look on the way home tonight, just literally look at the adverts and be well, I remember that tomorrow. Just try it. And then tomorrow, try and remember it. They do not write to the hard disk of your brain. Most adverts, a great advert, like last year's John Lewis advert, Animated Bear or whatever, will write to my brain for years. Apart from that, I couldn't tell you a single advert that's on TV at the moment. And, you know, I'm semi-retired. I watch too much TV, mate. I've got Sky News on pretty much all day in the kitchen wow. as I sit there lonely, crying. <laughs> anyway, so getting the brain to notice an advert writes that brand to the hard disk, whether you think it's funny or not. So then I'm sure there was plenty of people that thought you were being very silly trying to ban cooking. The fact you had to think about it for a second, wrote it to the hard disk. Go back to digital, then when you bump into us on digital, be it PPC because you've searched takeaway leads or something, you've got a subconscious recognition that that's a brand that you trust because you've remembered it from somewhere. The adverts they're making now, it's a standard advert. It's not going to write to anyone's hard disk. You can do that kind of marketing. It's fine. That's what most big brands do but then you get into a money spending game you have to spend a lot of money to get adverts which are not remarkable written to people's hard disks and that is a game just you can afford to play sponsors x factor Mm. and football clubs and whatever but emerging startups that are on the start of their journey or in the middle of the journey cannot afford to be sponsoring x factor you have to be remarkable you have to say something that people are going to notice but that doesn't mean you have to be silly We were silly because our internal culture was a bit silly. It was authentic. There's nothing worse than a serious company like Ford trying to be funny. It's not authentic when they try to be funny. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like Tesla, it's a huge brand based on changing the world. They don't try and be funny so much. But they're very funny. But it's quite hidden humour in Tesla. You know, it's Easter eggs. Their product line spells out sexy. It's this Model S, the Model 3, Model X, the Model Y. Right, dance is sexy. They've hidden Mario Kart in their sat now, that kind of thing. So they're funny. I mean, they sent their car into space last year. Bad examples, that. <laughs> no, but it's a great example because it's authentic to Elon Musk. Yeah. If you read his biography, the best bit of that for me was realizing that he was inspired by Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Cool. So you spoke about the importance of you having a North Star in direction. How have you been finding direction in the last few years? Yeah, so initially, I had another startup that I founded. We really didn't know the strategy of what it was trying to do until it was probably 18 months, two years. And then we had another year or two experimenting around trying to get growth. I worked with 500 startups occasionally as a mentor for them. But also in that, we took our startup through their program and learned a lot about growth hacking. But really, that's actually about having a disciplined approach to experimenting and testing. So Rock Pamper Scissors was a booking app for hairstylists that work in salons. And it was really useful, especially in London. You could open it now and it would show you the stylists that are sitting around doing nothing. But what I learned from Just Eat, a big thing we learned from Just Eat, I said the word earlier, earned. I think we earned an awful lot of our growth. We didn't buy it. We earned it because the restaurants were good partners and let us put stickers up. 
and we'd support the restaurant through branding their menus. But we did that through hard work. We'd do a printing deal for our restaurant partners. They would get their menus printed at almost half price. If they just put our logo on it, fine. Before you know it, you've got more leaflets going through letterboxes than Domino's Pizza. We'd go round with a team, put stickers up on the windows. In more recent years, we'd go around putting the sticky out signs, the metal signs on the out above the doors. All of that stuff earned, not bought, by being a good partner to the restaurant. You can't do any of those things with a lot of other marketplaces. By doing those things, working with the restaurant partners, they grew the business as much, if not more, than anything else. Big marketing channel of the tens of thousands of restaurants you work with. Salons are not going to put big stickers up on their funky windows because they're yeah. stylish. The stylists themselves, in their chat with someone having the scissors, isn't necessarily going to say, hey, why don't you book online next time? Frustrating because that industry desperately needs to be digitized, in my opinion, because it's still an awful lot of independent salons are still using a, a paper book. You've got to bring them to make an appointment. Anyway, we decided after a year of experiments that it would probably take another two or three years for it to get in good shape. And mm. we just took the moral responsibility, like, we can't keep raising. We were able to raise more money, but we thought, we've already gone out there and done a couple of rounds saying buy. And it was already three, getting them for four years old at that point. Wow. The first two years, I wasn't paying too much attention to it because I was willing to just eat. It was a friend of mine was his founder. So it was really two or three years in before we nailed what the proposition should be, by which time we had a lot of energy had gone out. The founding team was to doing another two or three years' work to, to fix it. I feel bad for the other investors, but from a personal perspective, there's no bigger investor in that business than me. And for me, I was glad to learn the lessons. That was my first year or so out of Just Eat. Then during that time and ever since, I'm also an investor in a few other businesses, and I've done a lot of talking and mentoring around London of other startups. Like I said, I did a bit of mentoring for 500 startups, but also the mentoring for Seed Camp. I'm also one of their partners in their fund, and I also have a involvement in a company called Growth Invest, which is a platform for supporting small businesses and startups. So what I try to do now is help an organization like Growth Invest or 500. And then they can use me for open days yeah. or whatever, make office hours. I try not to get too heavily involved in individual businesses. And then this year, I have got too involved in an individual business. So I'm working with a very bright founder from the banking trade. And he's got a moral problem with overdrafts. Having worked in the senior banking roles himself for a decade or two, I mean, the problem of modern banking is that it's free at point of service for those of us in the black. So banking only can make money out of consumers if they're in debt. That's kind of crazy. Making your money yeah. for people that can least yeah, afford money. to pay you. And yeah. it's just the nature of how banking has evolved around the world. So he stepped away from his senior career in banking to try into this app that we've named Updraft. And Updraft is the wind that elevates balloons mm. and kites into the skies. If you're going to launch a fintech app in London right now, you need to be very clear about what you're doing because there's quite a few of them. We're about solving the overdraft problem for people. So what Updraft does, it plugs into your existing bank account, it analyzes your behavior, and it can predict accurately as you use it when you're likely to go over during the month. Forewarned is forearmed. Um, the founder, has seen knows from testing within the banking trade that just a text message telling people that they've gone overdrawn would result in, I don't know, say 30% of people getting out of overdraft pretty quick. Yeah. But of course, most banks don't tell you when you've gone overdrawn. Yeah, yeah. It's not in their interest to tell you because they're making those 50p yeah. days. I did it once by accident. Like, I didn't need you. I had plenty of money in a different account. And I just found out like 50 quid charge. Shit, like, and don't like, I mean, you just dealt with that for me. You had all my money anyway. They can't because if they do, they lose millions of pounds from everything. Yeah, yeah. So annoying. Their hands are tied. They can't help you. And that's exactly what this thing will do. So you're likely to go overdrawn in two days. Do you want to move money from A to B? It makes suggestions. And the second thing it will do is if you do need to go overdrawn because you haven't got anywhere else to move it from, it will then replace your overdraft with a much cheaper loan until the next payday. Nice. And it's not a wonga. It's interest rates very, very low. And the idea being that we don't have to run bank accounts. We're going to plug into bank accounts. We can keep our operating costs low our cost of capital low and pass it on to the consumers and lift people out of yeah. debt. Cool. 
Yeah, so for me, that's a rare example of a company that I get heavily involved in helping. And mm. obviously, that one's got a strong social benefit to it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be massively interested in that fintech app. Do you not worry that it's in a place where there's not going to be a lot of room for profits and people aren't going to want to pay a lot? No. You worry a lot, don't you? A lot of your questions yeah. like, do you worry? <laughs> Maybe you're a worrier. Yeah. We well, should go for a coffee so. afterwards. We'll go for your startups and I'll just see what you're worrying about. Yeah. Yeah, there's a few things I'm worried no, it's about. not my job to worry. It's the founder's job to worry about yeah. things. My job as a midwife is to try and help him get his story straight, his mm. brand straight. And that's what we've been doing. By helping him get his story straight, then that helps him with his fundraising, which I co-pilot and help him with a little bit. But the fact that we've got the brand story correct makes it a lot easier for him. He doesn't just look like another fintech startup. People go, well, what's going on? My mom's are so well funded. And well, I've been there with my own startups. You don't spend half a meeting explaining why you're not like the incumbent success that's already in the city. You're going to start off with, we are not Monzo, we're not Revolut. Bang. This is a fintech app with one purpose in mind, which is to help people get out of debt. On the journey of getting people out of debt, it will make enough lifetime value out of the more interest rates it's charging to more than cover that and make profit. Then the roadmap beyond overdraft is to help people get out of other forms of debt. Nice. I want to help businesses that I think are going to do good for society. Yeah, and then you said you're experimenting with yourself, was in like you're thinking about the future and when people don't ever need to work for money, as you haven't had to work for money, you just kind of find things that might do with their life. We just lost the audience now. He doesn't have to work for money. Oh, yeah. a wanker. Well, if you work hard, then you work for them. And you'll mm. start your business one day. Yeah, um, then what would you do? <laughs> exactly, what would you do? And I feel like I have a moral responsibility to founders like you, Sam, to find exciting, interesting things to do with my free time as I've accidentally semi-retired at 42. I don't want to do it. I'd rather be at work. But I feel I've got a duty to people like you to play Red Dead Redemption a lot and get my um, horse bonding skills up yeah. on that so that you can have, a again, your own North Star. We want to be like Matt. We want to be sitting around in our pants playing Red Dead Redemption while his kids call him lazy. And I think my other co-leaders of Just Eat, who've also been lucky enough to be able to retire, also struggle with it. Because that company was so sociable. Mm. It was so much about internal culture. When you decide to step back and spend more time with your family, yeah, it's really lonely. Because you're suddenly in the house with your family doing the school run and you've had a 20-odd year career working your nuts off startups and doing digital marketing. To then be like, oh, what do I do today? But you've got to generate your own content and it's really hard. And I'm sure many people that have had unplanned, scheduled periods of unemployment in their careers where you've just things have gone wrong and they've had to take a break or start look for something else and it's taken them six months. So for at least an hour or so a day, you're looking for your next gig. But when you don't intend to bother having another gig because you're a lazy, feckless layabout like me, it can be quite depressing. Sorry to hear that. Yes. Poor me. <laughs> Poor Matt. Poor Matt. But it is a challenge. And I think a lot of people do drift back into taking a job. Not because they need the money, because they just miss having somewhere to go for five days yeah. a week with other people. So I did a lot of exploring and hobbies. I tried the guitar. It didn't work long. I did acting lessons once. Acting lessons was the most fun of the hobbies mm. I've tried. I've done a lot of travelling. I've been up Kilimanjaro. I've, been, I've done the Inca Trail. I've done all these fun, fun things. But I'm getting near the end of the bucket list of all those mm. kind of things I want to do. And it goes back to the quest for purpose. And this is something I've given a lot of thought to, not just for myself, but more where society's going and why we've got Brexit and Trump. What are we going to do for purpose in a world where an awful lot of people might not need to work. And what I've done myself is set myself a goal of a second career. I used to arrogantly think that job of a global CMO was a bit like being a film director, in that there's lots of departments, all have got to be at the top of their game. Your job is to help those departments get set up and fulfil their own creativity. And your job is direction and the story and make sure the production still has money and budget. I used to fantasise about, oh, I'm like a film director, directing my Don't Cook, Just Eat story. So yeah, so now I've done a few film studies courses and I love it. So next year I might even be doing a master's in film studies. I don't know if I'll ever make a film. If I'm sure if I do, it would be terrible. 
But I think if you've got the right mindset, it'd be awesome. Yeah, no, it's, it's going to be terrible. <laughs> okay, it goes back to giving yourself a purpose. I heard a great interview with somebody once, I think it was an economist for the Free Economics podcast. The guy on the Free Economics one had done a study of people that lived healthier longer in retirement. And it's people that carry on working in their retirement with a new job, much more healthy and happier than people that are properly retired. The challenge is to give yourself a new job that you really enjoy doing. So he'd set himself the objective of becoming a pro golfer when he retired. But if he just did it as a hobby, he knew it wouldn't be yeah. as good mentally for him as trying to take it seriously. That's set himself cool. KPIs, have performance reviews, treat it as a job with his coach. That's stuck in my brain. If I really can't be bothered to go back to five days a week working, then I need to set myself a new purpose that's a proper job. So I've set myself the purpose of learning to be a filmmaker. It's my hobby. I love films, but also by having a purpose of studying, it gives me a structure to the day. Yes. I'm making myself sound very lazy on this podcast. Yeah. I'm not that lazy. I do mentoring in London, but I've done that for three or four years now, and there's only so many times you can have the same conversations with founders. Okay. Yeah. A bit bored of it. But for me, it's a bit of why I'm doing this podcast is I can say the same piece of advice to one person a million times, or I can get much better advice than I can even give from people that yeah. can go to millions of people at once, and hopefully it's more useful. Yeah. I don't think millions of people are going to download this episode, though. I think it, uh, you know, it's going to be in the day. tens. Yeah. <laughs> I'd hate me if I was listening to this now. This arrogant bastard. All you did was help build a curry website, sell mm. pizzas. But not many people have Who does he think he is? Who does he think he is, Zuckerberg? <laughs> yeah. The dream of all of us is to have that big exit. Yeah, yeah, but then what? And then what's the on the other side? I could have gone back to work, and I wouldn't rule it out going back to regular work. It wouldn't be as a CMO again, because I've done it. And it was really successful. And it's a bit like, mm. wow, I'm never going to be that good again. That was lucky. Everything else is going to look like a disaster after that. So you better find yeah, a whole new profession true. to fail in. That's tarnishing the reputation of the yeah, thing yeah. you were good at. But it's mm. interesting. You look at the founders of Facebook and Google, Twitter, and all these other places, and they're all still working five days a week, if not more, on yeah. those products. And they're billionaires. They're not at work for the money. So why are they yeah, at work? Yeah. They are trying to change the world. You know, Zuckerberg has messed up, but I don't think he's inherently evil. And the guys at Google, I don't believe are inherently evil. I mean, look at all the other investments they've made in AI, robotics. They've got a vision of what they're trying to do, and they've got the infrastructure and the army to do it. But when you're running a successful marketplace for kebabs, yeah, you don't necessarily have that purpose that you're going to carry on yeah, for 50 yeah. years. These guys are still working at Twitter and Google and Facebook or what have you, they've got a big vision of, I yeah, want the world sense. to be more connected or I want to share the world's information within nanoseconds or whatever it might be. So um, as boring as it is, annoying as it is, be one of the people that's lucky enough to escape the rat race. There is a slight responsibility to live a purposeful life. It isn't that easy, actually. It's easier to go to work. Yeah. The first thing you do if you go for the doctor about having depression or something is like, do you have a job? That's the first biggest indicator of what you should sort out in your life is to have a job, a sense of purpose. I think sense of purpose is a really important topic and the lack of meaningful work. We really have to start thinking about meaningful, not just work. And I'm from a working class background originally and the working class communities are working, but are those jobs meaningful? That lack of meaning we're not building as many cars as we used to. We're not the great industrial engineering force that we were. It's beyond the working class communities we traditionally think of it. Now it's obviously affecting middle class. And as AI, etc., and all founders you're talking to on this podcast is working on interesting AI bits and bobs, it might make jobs more meaningful for those that have jobs because it would take the meaningless away. But the meaningless is easiest for robots to replace quite quickly. Yeah. So just go to somewhere that's really struggling and look at the sort of jobs people are doing. It's boring. They're bored. Meaningless jobs, even if they have them. So they want to kick the establishment in the bollocks and long comes Brexit. So finding purpose can sound really cliche. Oh, we need to find purpose in life. Oh, great. It's going to sign up retreat for 20 days like you did. Yeah. Speaking about purpose is an increasing problem in wellness. That there's so many jobs that are just pointless and Go back to the word meaning. This job means nothing. 
And those jobs will be the ones that will be replaced cheaply and quickly yeah. in the next 20 years. And people that have jobs will have probably better jobs because of the meaningless stuff will be much easier to outsource. Yeah, so an interesting few years ahead of us, which leads on to the prediction of what do you think the world's going to be like in five years' time? I think it'll be pretty much the same. Something surprising might have happened. It generally doesn't change much five years to five years unless you have an incendiary incident like 9-11. Yeah. From that perspective, I don't think AI is going to be much of a problem in five years. What about in marketing? What do you think would be the next big thing in 10 years? So no longer Facebook ads, like what's going to be driving people? People are going back to brands. I'm certainly advocating people do that now. It's back to basics. I have too many conversations with people that try to optimize this channel, that channel. And initially, when a new channel comes along, like Twitter or something, you can have initial success. But eventually, too many other brands catch wind that it's successful. And the CPAs obviously become more competitive. So those things are good to just catch the wave of. And that's, for me, the big learning from Just Eat was actually going back to basics of wow, we've got to tell good stories. It doesn't matter if we turn our story in a shop window or on Facebook or an email. Having a coherent story that people notice and remember is the basic job. I don't think that's ever changed. No, it's not. I think we, and I say we as digital marketeers, you know, I was a digital marketeer professionally. We ascended in power very, very quickly because the ROIs of our work was so good compared to brand people. That's now rescinding. I see so many, lots of presentations about CPAs flying through the roof. But it goes back to the basics of telling good stories. I think marketing is not a science. It's an art and a science. And the science bit took over because it's the whole mantra of if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, we shouldn't do it. Took over. But there's a lot of stuff you can't measure with branding. But you really do have to do it. Cool. Yes, so you mentioned the book Eating Big Fish. Do you have any other favourite books? I'm really not interested in business books. Story books? Fiction? Well, I really enjoyed the um, well, Sapiens, that guy. He's mm. book. I really enjoyed that book. There are lots of people who have read that book. I've read loads of books. The moment what I've started doing, because I'm trying to learn to write scripts, is I've figured out how to put PDFs onto my Kindle. That's been my revelation. There's a world of free books. Yeah, you right. can just download a PDF of your favourite films. So that's my current habit is reading a script. I just read Thelma and Louise. And last week I read Six Percent. It was great. And I don't mind listening to business podcasts like this one, Growth Mindset. It's great. I've listened to at least three of them in preparation for today. Podcasts are great for me, but most of my podcasts are film related. Okay. So script notes. I recommend script notes. Actually, script notes is a good one for founders. They discuss inside baseball topics really about what's going on inside Hollywood's business from a business point of view as well as how to write script it's really great insight into that little industry that affects all of us because we watch so much of its output cool so we've spoken about quite a few things that you give people in terms of advice when you're talking to founders and things is there any things that you haven't yet shared that you nearly always tell someone as a founder that they should be thinking about well yeah I mean we get your story sorted Hire people that like that story and will help you tell that story. And again, a lot of people want to tell you what they're doing and what a brilliant business opportunity is. I don't really care. The public doesn't really care. Everyone's polite. You can go and meet investors for weeks and who take meetings with you to hear about your great idea. And they'll be ever so polite to you, but they'll never invest. Okay, cool. What is your most vivid memory from childhood? You've gone right off topic into yeah. some weird dark <laughs> I'm 44, I can barely remember being 30. I guess one of the earliest memories is coming out of primary school and then walking up to someone's legs thinking it was my mum, cuddling her, then it was not my mum, and then screaming the proposal, <laughs> terrified. But yeah, I think I pretty much enjoyed my childhood. So you can tell from this podcast, I enjoyed my geek films, I enjoyed my Star Wars, I enjoyed my video games, and somehow those things have given me skills that work well in digital marketing. Nice, okay. And what is the kindest thing that someone's ever done for you? It's really hard to think of things off the top of your head, isn't it? That's why you, it's a really good idea if you send these questions out before, so people can read them. Some of them you might get amazing answers for <laughs> just randomly. And sometimes I'm really bad at that. It's fine. One of my yeah, key memories, so. I'm not answering the question, I'm going to answer another question, is that at Just Eat, we did a big uh, company presentation-y thing, and I prepared. I'm not a nervous public speaker, as mm. you can 
probably gleaned from what I'm just mm. waffling on on your podcast. And I'm not bad at improvising in the moment, but I'm really bad when someone throws a question at me. It's like my boss was like, what animal would you be? I'm like, I couldn't even think of a single animal. I was like, yeah. well, <laughs> where'd that come from? It's like, it's like what? God, I'd be a gorilla. I'm like, what? I don't know. Because it's like, I'd want to think about getting the right answer to that. Like yeah. Black Panther. Or something yeah. really cool. So what was your question? That we were uh, to the kindest thing that someone... Kindest thing? I don't know. I can't think of anything. That doesn't mean people don't do kind things. I think I'm quite a giver. I do kind things for people. What's your favourite kind thing to do for others? Is that if you see people struggling, you can secretly try and help them out. So that's quite a nice thing. But I can't disclose those moments. Honestly, the best thing about doing the IPO Just Eat was I bought a house by the seaside in Norfolk. And we didn't tell any of our family. And it's seven bedrooms. And deliberately got seven bedrooms, so we worked out we could sleep the entire extended family there at once if we ever needed to. And then the summer we bought it, we said, oh, we're on holiday in Norfolk for two weeks to our parents. We come up and join us for a day or two. And when they came up, we gave them the keys and said, this is now your holiday place. Oh. And the looks on their faces when they got given a holiday cottage to share was yeah. priceless. So, yeah, I've answered your question about what people have done kindly to me by giving yeah. examples of when I'm super kind. Yeah, do you not ever suffer with issues of now that you've IPO'd and you've got all your millions of people kind of, I've really got this problem right now, Matt, can you just help me out? I do have a struggling Patreon account if you want to... Uh... I've given you sweat equity on my, <laughs> yeah. on my time. I do support the other Sam Harris, though. Yeah? Really? Play what? Podcast. Yeah. Yeah. He's got plenty of supporters. I can't go to your Patreon. You should put, I should start yeah, a Patreon. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's ridiculous. We'll be buying you free mentoring, say, mm. just for charity. Cool. And yeah, you have any other questions you want to ask me? Well, should we go and get a cup of tea? Yeah, so cool. It's a wrap. Thanks for coming on the show. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Well, that's the end of the interview. And thanks again for Matt coming on the show and sharing some incredible lessons and some really personal insights into his life. It's so fascinating to just find out what the hell someone does when they arrive in such a unique situation. And it's just the kind of conversation I'm so grateful to be able to have from running the podcast and to be able to share with all you guys. So I left in the whole section where we get specific advice on marketing, which I normally separate out and host on my Marketing Mindset podcast. I felt like it was just too integral to the interview as a whole to cut it out, though it is of course available as a condensed Marketing Wisdom episode on the Marketing Mindset podcast if you ever want to listen back. And now let's dive in to the top tips. Number one, tell a story that is different. People don't care about advertising or what it is that you're up to. It's really hard to build a brand. So to make a campaign that people actually engage with, you have to push the boat out and really make people think about what you're telling them and just make it something memorable. Number two, have a purpose. Things get pretty depressing pretty quickly when you don't have a purpose. It's really interesting to see what happens in life when you have basically arrived at all the metrics of success one needs to achieve in one's life. And what the hell do you then go and do? You need to have a purpose to just keep things positive and moving in the right direction. Number three, give back. Looking after those around you and giving back to the people that helped you or people that can learn from you is really important and it's a crucial way to just not get caught up in all your own problems and just be grateful for what you do have and what you can offer to the world. Bonus tip, you only need to be good at one thing and the power of teams is incredible. So you really don't have to be good at everything. Matt justifiably earned a lot of money at Just Eat by adding a lot of value to the company, despite the fact that he really only had a few major skills at telling great stories and building a brand. He wasn't even good with metrics and data, despite the fact he was a CMO. This shows that if you have a great team around you who bring all the right skill sets to the table and you can work together as a group, you can achieve something amazing that could never be done just by yourself. So trying to do everything by yourself and being really like, oh, I have to get this skill and that skill and this skill, is actually overkill when you can really leverage yourself if you just work with the right people. And now onto the section for books. Matt loves books and reads them avidly, despite him saying they take up a lot of time. In the podcast, he recommended Eat the Big Fish by Adam Morgan, which is all about taking a smaller brand and challenging the big brands in the market and then beating them, which is exactly what Just Eat did and thus a perfect book for further reading after listening to this podcast. He also recommended Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari, which is a masterpiece on the evolution and history of the entire human species 
up to today and why the world is how it is and it's just a beautiful insight into human minds and what the hell we do and why we do it so a really good read thus i'm very happy to recommend my sponsor today instaread instaread transforms non-fiction books into 15 minute audiobooks each instaread gives you all the key insights from the book along with a synopsis analysis and commentary if you're interested in self-improvement books business healthy living history psychology etc then instaread is for you Thanks to their professional summaries, you'll truly understand what's inside a book without spending weeks actually reading it. InstaRead just saves you tons of time. I personally find it a great way to get a basic knowledge of some of the best books that it's just physically impossible to actually read all of them. And it's just also a good screening tool. If you find that the InstaRead summary really fascinates you for a book, then you know it's probably worth reading the full book. So you don't risk buying books that waste your time and money. I really enjoyed their summaries of 21 Lessons for the 21st Century by Yuval Noah Harari and their breakdown of the 80-20 principle. Some books you should just revisit several times and InstaRead is a perfect hack for reminding you of the important lessons you learned without needing to reread the whole thing. So check it out at instaread.co. They have an unrestricted free trial for 7 days and they're offering our listeners a 20% discount on the annual plan. So use the code GROWTHMINDSET in one word at checkout. That's instaread.co, not .com, and the code is growth mindset. Get smarter with InstaRead today. You've just listened to an episode of the Growth Mindset Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe on your preferred app and give me a good rating as these go a really long way. If you are unable to give good feedback right now, try sharing the show with a friend who will, or just wait for the show to improve. If you have any ideas for the show or you just want to chat, then please reach out to me on Twitter at Sam Harris Tweets or Instagram at Sam Jam Snaps. Show notes and other links to topics discussed in the episodes are available at the website growthmindsetpodcast.com. Thanks so much for listening. Give yourself a big hug from me. If you're with a friend, give them a hug as well. And I hope you enjoy your next podcast.